So, this is the first book. I apologize. Okay. It's not too bad. Um, this is just our first walkthrough. We're kind of doing, we do a brief walkthrough so we know what everything on our wall is before we start deciding if we're going to go forward with it or if we're going to um, decorate a Christmas tree. You got more options than we do in transportation. We only have one bill up on our wall. Well, we only had three until about three days ago. <laughs> we, so we now have an abundance of riches to get through. So we're going to try and do most of that today. So we're off. So for the record, Senator Perks of Washington County, I had, after I got elected, I went to my orientation found out that I could do bill requests from Ledge Council. So I started thinking about bills and I'm interested in supporting our child care program, which is continually underfunded and over -prescribed. So a, a report that I was familiar from sitting in the wings of this committee was the ex tax expenditures report. Mm -hmm. So I was looking through that report and said like, oh, we, we do not, have the sales tax on candy. And thinking of children, I thought there was a connection there. So if we could tax candy, add the 6% sales tax to candy, that money could help child care financial, financial assistance program. If I sent that idea to Ledge Council, they wrote up a bill and voila, I'm here. I have talked to senators in the, since this was introduced, it said like, yeah, nice try. We've tried it 16 other times. It never goes anywhere. Uh, and I need more warning there. Jim, yeah. Jim Harrison is in the House now, not as a lobbyist. Mm. But he had his legendary shopping bag. And there's, because we exempted, I don't know. Right. It gets it gets messy. Yogurt covered this. Right. and it, Is this a candy or is it a snack? You got it. And he just keep it right. So. Uh, so what did the, to speak to that a little bit, there, this is slowly happening in other states. So I found 12 other states that do this, that use the same definition that Ledge Council, like maybe that's why Ledge Council picked that. I didn't, I didn't pick this definition because I didn't know that the definition was an issue. So may, as more and more states pick an issue on how to define candy, maybe it becomes a little easier for distributors and store owners to, to know. The other thing that I'd say to that point is I've also learned through my time in transportation with the chair who owns a store that does sales tax <laughs> on items, is that there are other items where it's kind of unclear. Mm -hmm. So we already live in a system where store owners have to decide, do I sales tax? Is this, does this get the sales tax or Tell them ice is taxable. Yeah, Have Maza that. loves talk about the ice. ice. Yeah. Yes. So that's so we're already living with the yeah. uncertainty of whether you tax ice or not. And I, and he had some other examples out there. Um, so I think we could we could live with some looseness around the definition of candy and survive and, and still one you know have this revenue for a needed source. And, we and the are, exemption, if I we think, don't like exemptions. Yeah. Part of it is, if we've got other states doing it, then we may find that some of the larger retailers have ICU codes that will just get read. That's one of the issues, is how do I code it and what do I code? But right. There's it does take a while for ideas to find. This might be the year. This might be the year. I think there was 16 that, that, that have the, or maybe even more that, that tax it, but 12 that use that same definition. 16 states. Yeah. Okay, the big question. Maple sugar. It's candy. I don't know, let's look at the definition. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it says natural or artificial sweetener. I think yes. Is the answer that, that was that was one of the death knells? Why right, we, yeah. we were hitting maple candy? Right. Well, so I'm open to an amendment that I, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't think that would quite be legal. Is but maple beer exempt from uh, any taxation? Just a thought. No. You know, apple not. cider, hard cider. We, no. We charge. We do that. Oh. Yep. So. so 
Yeah. It worked for uh, apple cider. So this this is, is the allowance. Uh, How much maple candy are you Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not maple syrup. No. How much money, by the way, are we talking yeah. about? Uh, I think Joint Fiscal had, had sent me an estimate. I don't think I got it from Ledge Council of, of just a couple million dollars. It wasn't a huge number. And I think that was probably another reason why it gets killed is like it gets complicated and you're on like, track and I'm $1.5 million. Like, let's. Well, for child care? Yeah, I thought for child care, one thing to think about is just that notion of tax everything and tax nothing. Because you know we're killing yeah. ourselves with with all these tax yeah. exemptions. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it becomes complex to administer. They don't bring a lot of revenue. Uh, it becomes a nightmare for retailers to deal with. The public sort of doesn't understand it. I don't understand it. I've been here voting on this stuff for years. Yeah, uh, yeah. It would be a lot simpler if we said anything yeah. that is sold in a convenience store, defined convenience store, is taxable. Right. I agree. In fact, I think other states, I thought that, so I hadn't looked into it, but I think other states get around that. So like if it's if it's in a grocery store, we're going to call it food. Mm -hmm. If it's in a convenience store, we're going to call it candy or mm -hmm. uh, a, a luxury. Buy a lot of not food in it's a grocery store. store. But I don't know how you define that. What do you do with a Walmart here. superstore? Yeah. In some communities, their, their convenience store is their grocery store. Yeah. In Vermont, in a large right. number of communities, it is so. Okay. So that's the uh, issue, and I'm glad you're going to de dedicate all your time to it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's, that, this is one that, if it survives, may make it onto a Christmas tree. It'll be interesting to see what the new tax commission says about taxing services, because that was the recommendation mm -hmm. of the last one. And if you taxed enough, you know, I've spread it out, you could lower the rate significantly. And the biggest objection to that, uh, you know, that, that I heard, of course, is the fear that once the tax rate got lower, it becomes easier for the legislature to say, well, let's just add another quarter percent, and in five years, you're back to where you were before with a wider base. But that, that it also runs into the problem that everybody will still have their pet thing that they think should be exempted from it, and you're back to the Christmas tree again. Tuxedo rentals are exempt. Are exempt? Are. They are? On what grounds, Madam Chair? <laughs> On what grounds? What about the prom dresses? I, I don't think prom dresses are. Oh, really? I don't know. Oh, I don't know about oh, this. Okay. That's, Whoa, that's a sexist. I think bride, bridal grounds should also be exempt. But they're clothing. Oh, because it's a rental. Right. Yeah. Well, there's, there's lots of, well, okay. we, never mind, about to spiral down, moving on. Okay, up. it's too early in the week and it's too <laughs> early in the session to be getting this whippy. By 10 o'clock at night, we frequently get this whippy. Not, not yet. Okay. All right. Peter, so I'm off to you dare it. come up here? Sure. Okay, this is just our turn. Bobby is not here today? Correct. Ah, mm -hmm. all right. Oh, he's here. So maybe, Peter, yeah. while you're here, you can just walk us yeah. through 270, S77 at the same time. Sure. So Peter Griffin, Office of Legislative Council, uh, over S. 71 and S77. Um, as Senator Principal's explaining, uh, S71 is a fairly simple bill. Uh, right now, we exempt food from the sales tax. Candy is included as food, so it is currently exempt. The language you see in front of me on page one would add candy to the list of things that is not considered food, therefore subjecting it to the um, sales tax. The definition of candy down the bottom of the page and on the uh, back of page two, as Senator Perchlick noted, a number of other states have that same definition. Vermont is a member of the Streamlined Sales and Use Tax Agreement, and as such, we agree to use a set of common definitions. So that's where this language about candy comes from. Uh, and there are other streamlined states that have worked with this definition, uh, both in terms of implementation uh, and interpretation. Uh, the, uh, I've been here now long enough. I've seen now Representative Harrison do his presentation. Uh, he where he often, examples, yes, he would often complain about the the definition. Part of the definition it talks about um, 
candy shall not include any preparation containing flour. Mm -hmm. The intent of the streamline group was to distinguish cakes and pastries. Um, but there are certain types of, he always pulls out certain types of things you think of as being candy that have yeah. flour. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, no. But I mean, it's not really, I, I just wanted to find you. I know, you know that's candy that, when I look at it, a Kit Kat is a candy. <laughs> You're treading on but the But I just wanted to flag you, that's where that definition came from. So that was, are these uh, peanut butter cups? Uh, it would be the streamlined definition we would be okay. using as long as we're part of that agreement. Uh, the other issue I wanted to flag for you is that that makes this a little bit different. I know this, this issue has come up before in the past, um, but this year is a little bit different in that all the sales tax revenue now goes into the education fund. So um, if you, oh, like Senator Perch would like to do, uh, in, make a, a change in law that, that brings in more sales tax revenue, but he would like to spend it on something that's not an education, currently an education yeah. fund expense. So that's why there's language on the second um, and, uh, and third sections back here, allowing money to come out of the uh, end fund to, for child care financial assistance program payments. And I just want to throw that out there for you because well, that, that, is a, line that, is, want to do that. that is a new dynamic this year when you're yeah. talking about sales tax exemptions and the but the general fund should have more money because we're not doing property, because we're losing the sales tax. So no, we don't <coughs> have more money. We lost the sales tax revenue, but we're getting to keep the uh, uh, transfer general, general to the end fund. Yeah. yeah. So, but the sales tax came in a little ahead of projection, even though we knew the Wayfair was likely to come down. It did come down before we went home. Um, but it does prove Senator Brock's supposition that it's, it's, it, it, we haven't even done this for one year and we've now got two proposals to steal it. So we'll see. I know the House has said something, at least the chair has like that chance, but we'll <coughs> see where that goes. Okay. All right. That's that one. That's that. All right. So on to S77. Excuse me. Do you know how much that would raise? The candy. Yeah. I think Senator Ferdinand said one point five. I thought he said two. I thought he said two. Yeah. A million? That's what he said. I'm going to ask Ross. It's about one to three million. One to three. One to three. One to three million. One to three. That's a lot of candy. But as the chair says, child care, that could be. Yeah. Exactly we have to take oh, I see what you're saying in terms of candy. Yeah. Okay. Of candy. This is probably not a good week to be talking about tax and candy. Next week. Because it's Valentine's Day. Put that on your hour and put that in a bottle if you don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next week. Yeah. Next week. 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 That candy. That's candy. Uh, S77 is in a bill introduced by Senator Starr that has to do with the land gains tax. I believe Graham was in here last week. Yeah, or we he was. Yeah. did a presentation on the land gains tax, and the administration has a proposal to repeal the land gains tax. This bill is more narrow. Uh, it adds to the list of exemptions from the land gains tax uh, land that is purchased by the United States, the state of Vermont or instrumentalities and agencies. I, um, it's a sl slightly awkward position. I'm not here to pitch the bill, but I, I worked with Senator Starr on the bill, and I know that um, the genesis of this bill was with a constituent concern, um, and I think Senator Starr would be more able to uh, articulate um, the, the problems around that. Okay. But basically there was a, a, a land purchase, uh, I believe it was by a municipality, and it, the land was being purchased for a public use, and they, um, it was an issue about whether the land gains tax was due. And the thinking was, this wasn't, uh, the land gains tax, at least in, in theory, was originally designed oh, to uh, uh, cut down on land, land speculation and flipping. Yeah. And the thinking was that if the purpose of the purchase is for public use, um, it's not for some sort of for-profit development, I it, it might make sense it, to add those to the list of exemptions. They take it by eminent domain. 
Well, you didn't even want to sell it. <laughs> but are you thinking of that kind of public use, okay. or are you thinking another kind of? I I I was thinking of the details of the, the transaction, but I but I believe uh, uh, there's an attorney in Derby who had a client who sold some land to a municipality, and the question arose about whether the land change tax would be due. So he had the attorney thought it. this doesn't make sense. This isn't the land speculation situation. This is somebody who's. Just conducting an arm's length transaction. Every time Bobby comes in here with a land or tax thing, I kind of cringe. Yeah. <laughs> Is it Vince Luzzi that wants this? <laughs> Who's the puppet Who's master? Who's the attorney in this thing? All right, we're going to deal with it on the merits. We have another bill that would What's actually right? do What's away right? with the land gate. <laughs> um, That's right. Because, yeah, the, the issue it was set up to prevent is pretty much gone now with all the local planning, zoning, mm -hmm. except in Orange County, yes. Uh, yeah. Speculation. We, we don't. So I'm writing an example. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but it does seem, especially if we take it by eminent domain, that then charge you with speculation tax is a little. A little difficult. Okay. All right. Senator, you had something you wanted to share? Uh, we did a tour of the state maybe four years ago on, um, on the current use issues. We mm -hmm. were dealing with a 10% penalty. And what we found was that many, many of the people who had engaged in current use started in the late 70s and 80s and uh, did forest husbandry and produced uh, beautiful woodlots. And what is happening to them is someone calls up and says, I want to buy your woodlot. And the first thing they do is they write a check for 10% of the fair market value of the woodlot the day they buy it, which releases them from all um, of their requirements for forest management that, they, that were in place for 40 years one was on current use. And then they cut as much as they can within the clear cutting laws. And then they call up the, the realtor and they say, Want this divided up into most lots you can possibly divide up for, and I want it on the market. And they're doing this before the last law has been chipped or sent off the property. And Where? Pardon? Where? Um, they called me to do that. They've done it in, in several places in, in Washington and throughout the state. There's not a lot of it going on. They're building housing? They, they divide the land up into smaller plots and sell it because they're not in the land business, they're in the harvesting of forest resources business, okay. and they get the markup on the land, um, which is substantial, um, because you know they buy it at a, at a hundred acre price, um, they liquidate the lumber, and then they buy it up and sell it, and move on to the next one. Let's ask the yeah. tax department if they can document that, because that would be something to, um, and to document. Get put, uh, so you have a lot of logic, the, the, um, the president of the Forest Association of Vermont. The foresters. The, yeah, that's the, what it is, right? Putts. Yeah. The, 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 the chair of the president of Vermont lives in the Hampshire. President of Vermont. Does he help us find some? Yeah, he's not hard to find. So that's the. the okay, that's good to know. Right. I get cold calls to buy my land. I mean, these people from. Where are you from? Oh, Oklahoma. You don't have that much forest. Could I just add uh, a story uh, about you your piece? Back okay. to the bill at hand, or maybe this is for others as well. In the case of somebody sells their land to the public use, would the tax commissioner have authority to waive the land gains tax if they were petitioned? There wouldn't be any, no, I mean, there wouldn't be any statutory basis for the commissioner. We I'm trying to think of this as sort of generalized equity authority, there's not. And I'm trying to think, usually, sometimes these lists of exemptions, the last one will say, you know, and for having a catch all thing, but there's not in this particular tax. So I think the answer is no. Yeah. And even then, we have some. I guess we can't delegate our authority to tax, but we could probably delegate authority to forgive tax. To, sorry. 
we've, we've had issues where we cannot delegate, say the commissioner can put a tax on if he thinks it's necessary, because we can't, the legislature can't delegate its taxing authorities, my understanding. But maybe we could not have the same issue with, he could waive the tax for good cause. Because one of these guys might buy it up hearing that the town wants to buy it. Buy it from the widow lady dirt cheap and sell it to the state for state park or something. So be interesting to look at. We'll have Senator Starr in um, to let him tell us about this one and we'll probably well, if we do the other bill, we won't have to worry about this one. <clears throat> if we don't do the other bill, this might be our first step in that direction. But if we are seeing the situation that Senator McDonald says, then that should give us pause. So we'll see if we can trace that down, either through the foresters or through the tax department, because they ought to know um, what they're seeing in land gains and who's paying it and who's not. Speaking of who's not, yes. um, the, uh, the, the, I got a whistleblower, I can't find a whistle, who um, says that, that a lot of the EB-5 land was exchanged and land gain taxes weren't paid, and it was all known in the upper echelons of government and the mayor and making wow. accusations. Yeah. I think it's better to check that out. Well, talk to the tax department. People I don't think, want to talk. Yeah, well, I think we ought to, uh, before we make any move, we ought to get the entire picture on this. And see if it sounds so simple now, we're thinking of, but we are thinking about people buying that forest land and then stripping it and then selling off smaller lots of strip land. So. One is Representative Till. We'll be down at two. We'll be down at two. Oh, okay. He's on his way. And Mick is Roberto here. Okay, good. So, thank you, Peter. And at three, moving everything up because I'm going to, we did away with the break. So I've got at least three of you. Is that until have a seat that need to drive to Chittenden County and given your experience getting there last week, um, I'm going to try and get you out of here before you start getting whatever kind of mess Mother Nature is going to give us at rush hour. So I'm going to take some uh, We've uh, we're going to keep working right through. Okay. Oh, this is e cigarettes. Okay. Talk to us. Um. Well, for the record, Representative George Still from Jericho, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thanks for hearing about H-47. Um, I don't know what kind of detail you, you want to hear about it. Did, did you just walk through it? With, no. No. Okay. No. Um, I was here to walk us through it. <coughs> so this is our first walkthrough. You can give us the background, why you did it. Um, okay. We did it last year, probably not to the extent of this bill, but um, we did a, a vaping tax, which got vetoed. Um, actually, I don't think it ever made it to the veto. Did, okay, I think it, came it back, make it to the I think it came back to us last year with an opiate tax. It was an opiate tax. We didn't have time to, yes. to take any testimony in the House. It was our tried. Christmas tree. Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, hopefully, kind of speaking to the, the choir, you know, this bill is a revenue that <coughs> raises a very small amount of revenue. The real point of this bill is the, the, the health care issue. Um, in December of 2018, the Surgeon General issued an advisory. And it's a sort of unusual thing for the Surgeon General to do. And what prompted him to do that was that the one-year data between 2017 and 2018 showed a 78% increase e-cigarette use in high school students, 78% in one year, and in middle school students, 48% in one year. 
So this is a huge increase, um, and it prompted him to say, this is an epidemic and we need to do something about it, about it promptly. Um, so um, what this bill does, H-47, is to, to simply put the same tax on the e-cigarettes and the paraphernalia that go with them as we have on what's called other tobacco products. So okay, that, this is the paraphernalia, because last year I think we just did the liquid inserts. Yeah, we started off last year with the same stuff and it ended up coming out really with just the, just the liquids. This year it's both. Um, and um, so it just treats these the same as it would other tobacco products. So, um, you know, I mean, you all know how addictive nicotine is. It's, you know, it's, it's horrible. And, you know, the, the, the companies know that if somebody gets to 21 years old um, without becoming addicted, they're probably never going to get addicted. So, you know, what we have is these vaping things which are going wild in the schools, um, which, you know, a, a 3 ml cartridge of these things contains as much nicotine as a whole pack of cigarettes. Okay. The little cartridges. A little cartridge with three mLs of fluid in it has as much nicotine as an entire, um, an entire pack of cigarettes. So you know that's so higher nicotine levels, younger brains, worse addiction. Um, you know, and you know, you know the statistic: ten thousand kids alive today in Vermont are going to die from tobacco-related illnesses. They're going to die on average ten years sooner than they would otherwise. Um, and you know, I don't know if you've ever watched anybody die from emphysema, but it is ugly. I mean, it's just years of not being able to get enough air. I mean, so it's a horrible, horrible disease. Um, so um, the e-cigarette addiction, the nicotine addiction, also increases the likelihood of you know other addictions later on. And so this has really become a, a, a public health crisis. And you know. The kids who start with the e-cigarettes are four times as likely to become regular smokers, regular tobacco smokers, as kids who don't use the e-cigarettes. Okay, so they clearly lead to a dramatic increase. And, you know, and, and countrywide, we're up to 20% of kids in high school who are, are using these things. So, you know, four times as likely to become regular tobacco smokers. Teenage regular tobacco smokers, three out of four become lifetime smokers. Okay, so so that 10,000 number of kids who are alive, the Department of Health uses 10,000 kids who are going to die, who are alive today in Vermont, that's going to go through the roof, and that's going to be much higher than than 10,000 if, if we don't do anything. Um, so I stopped in the my local store the night before we recorded this on the floor. And, and, and looked at because I, I was interested in the pricing of these things. And there, right on the counter, was you know a two pack of these little jewel things, and it was nine ninety nine. And one pack of cigarettes, on average, in the state is nine sixty two. Okay, so what you got is these things in all these flavors, with all this social media um, advertising they're doing, and priced about half the price of cigarettes. I mean, the, the intent here is very obvious. Um, to, to, to get these kids sucked in. Um, we also know that the taxes work with youth to reduce um, tobacco usage, tobacco products. And, you know, historically, every 10% you raise the tax on these things, um, you reduce utilization 3 to 5%. You know, so, it, you know, we, we, we know the, ta the taxes have a work. Um, work. There are 10 other states who currently um, tax the e-cigarettes. Um, the highest is Minnesota, which taxes at 95% of the wholesale level. Our tax is 92% of the of the wholesale level. Are we level. talking about yes. the paraphernalia or yes. just the Both. liquid? Both. 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 So I'm sorry, Representative, may I ask a question? So are there, there are some states that don't tax them at all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. So there are 10 states who already tax them. And, you know, some of those tax the way we're talking about at the wholesale level, some of them tax by how much liquid, just the liquid, and how much you're selling. But right now, in front of legislators, 22 additional states have bills to, to start taxing them. These are brand new. Yeah. She says it's only been around for 12 years. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, 
Um, you know, it's these things, the, the 22 states who are looking at it, um, almost all of them are using this, the system we're talking about, which is the wholesale value. And they range from 95% increase in Washington state to 24% increase in Indiana and everywhere in between um, those. So, you know, I mean, I just want to say these things are not smoking cessation devices. I've got a lot of really nasty emails um, telling me how I was killing people because these were saving lives. And there's just no evidence that that's true. The fact that they've only been around 10 years or 12 years if you cannot possibly know the long-term health effects of these things. You know, I mean, there, in, in one study out of the uh, University of California, San Francisco, used in a, um, a certain way, one product, they, it produced um, enough formaldehyde, which is a known carcinogen, in the vapor, to equal, just, we're talking about three ml cartridge here again, five packs of cigarettes worth of formaldehyde. Okay. So, I mean, that doesn't say every one of these products. There is tremendous variation. There's 7,700 flavors out there. There's a ton of different, different so we can't possibly know the long-term health effects, let alone the variation from one to the other, whether some are gonna be better than cigarettes, some are gonna be worse than cigarettes. Clearly, fewer toxins come out. You know, you get 600 toxins, or 60 toxins instead of 6,000 toxins. It's not just about how many toxins there are. And then the, the question comes up, okay, so why the paraphernalia? And, and that's a health issue too. Um, with the paraphernalia, it turns out that the heating coil um, ends up contributing a bunch of heavy metals into the vapor. And the, the vapor of uh, these things contains about 25 times the lead or some of the other heavy metals that you would find in the liquid. And it's this, the coil itself kind of disintegrating that computer. So that part of the core, the vaping device itself is part of the health risk with these things, the health concern. It was just, it's our news for a teenager that was killed because one Exploded blew up. Exploded in California. Yeah. And that's not the first. I mean, that's been, you know, it's that's the ones the, that don't have the battery. Yeah. There's all different kinds. Yes, this there's was so much variation in these things. So, Anyway, I, I, you know, I guess I would say, you know, you know we know that, that big tobacco is buying up these companies. I mean, they bought 35 percent of Juul, which has been the really quickly exploding company. Um, they just bought the, a Philip Morris uh, um, subsidiary, which is about 35 percent of Juul within the last three months. Um, you know, I, I applaud the governor for recognizing this epidemic, and you know, this bill move pretty quickly out of, out of our committee in the House was quite unanimous, but damn close. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's important. I don't think it's the whole answer in and of itself. I think that we need to do some additional things too. Um, but, you know, in terms of what we come to the Finance Committee, this is the, the, the first piece. Questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the nasty emails you got were from adults saying, He's taking mm -hmm. away a substitute for cigarettes. Yeah. And make them more expensive. And, and, and we had testimony But it sounds like it was more year. of a mitigation, right? That's what they thought? Like they were mitigating, like, you know, it was a transition away? People yeah. think every one of these is a demo. That, that okay. yeah. these things are helping stop. Right. So but they have more not, nicotine. Yeah, they have more nicotine, and the majority, significant majority of people who try to use them for a stop for stopping end up as dual users. So they smoke and do these. And even in the, there was a real recent uh, article out of the UK um, about the uh, you know, first randomized control trial and it shows that it helps people stop smoking. Well, when you read the dang article, what it did was get people to just switch to e-cigarettes. The number who actually stopped using nicotine products was no different than the number that stopped using it when they don't try any aid. A recent one in the New England Journal. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. If you look at the details of it. They, but, but George, to go back to what you were saying earlier, I mean, I have people in my own family who had emphysema, and it actually was a dramatic improvement to their health and well-being to switch from smoking cigarettes to vaping. I'm not saying that I want them using anything, yeah. but I understand that's anecdotal. Mm -hmm. But 
I know that their quality of life did drastically improve when they stopped smoking. And, and you know, it may very well be that, that some of these are safer and some of these are not safer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it's just, you know, the, the federal government's supposed to be <laughs> regulating what's in the liquids, but they've pushed that back to 2022. So, I mean, you could, you could put anything in there right now. There's nobody checking. Mm -hmm. so, you know, people that went from cigarettes to this. Exactly. Yeah, we had, we had a gentleman in last year, I'm oh, sure oh, that's he right. hit you too, yeah. where some of these don't have nicotine. They're just yeah. flavored. But, but again, the, you know, the health risks, the yeah. formaldehyde, that's not related mm -hmm. to the nicotine, the, you know, the, the heavy metals, that's not related to the liquids. And talk to us about, the, I don't know anything about these things, so, so when you say there's this many milliliters in it, and so how many doses are in? You get uh, three ml, yeah. um, you know, up to 200 plus, I gather, with that. That's like a pack of cigarettes. Right, yeah. well that's... Yeah. Yeah. What did you say? It sounds like it's close to a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. Right. So that yeah, I'm trying to yeah, figure yeah. out, like, if it is, right. if it is comparable to a pack of cigarettes, is it truly more nicotine? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's in that three mLs is the same as one pack of cigarettes. Of nicotine, exactly. And I, so I'm trying to get at how much are you, you know? It depends if you take big puffs or little puffs. Yeah. And then also, <laughs> is it all these things now come with. Some of these things now come with different, various nicotine levels. You can choose your nicotine level and deliver. Right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That might be where it helps some people, right? If you go well, down, I, mean, they, I don't know. Yeah. Look, you know, better than cigarettes is an awfully low bar. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, I mean, it may turn out that these things are helpful. We're not outlining them. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. just saying they shouldn't be cheaper than uh, you know, half the price of the tobacco products. Well, well I think yeah. these kids given the, to them. the price, the tax we have put on tobacco products, um, there should be some tax on it. I think we can argue about what, so, the, tax, so what the tax is and on what. And I'm sorry, Madam Chair, there's no tax now in Vermont at all? Uh, no. Sales tax. No 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 sales tax. Talk to us about the pricing and the taxing. A little bit. Talk to us about the pricing of these things, these are these cigarettes and the taxes yeah, so that are on cigarettes versus the sales tax. Yeah, that so, so you know, like the average price, the sales tax applies to both cigarettes and these. Okay. Um, but the excise tax is only on tobacco products, and <coughs> other tobacco products, and cigarettes and tobacco products. And how much is the excise tax on a pack of cigarettes? Oh, uh, ours is now three dollars and eight cents. That's different than than this. Other tobacco products like uh, pipe tobacco or chew or chaw or any, any of that stuff. Little cigars. It, yeah. Well, those those and cigarettes are taxed differently, but all the other other tobacco products are taxed at ninety two percent of wholesale. That's about, you know thought to be equivalent to. So that's what you're addressing this for, right? Yes. But the wholesale on this one is a lot higher. So you're doing the same percentage tax, but your wholesale, especially if you're pulling in the paraphernalia is a lot higher. Someone said it was like $8 on a pack of cigarettes and it's eight something and it's 25 something on. When you buy the whole. Yeah, I, we'll, yeah. we'll get yeah. right fiscal I mean, to figure they, that yeah, out. Yeah. But if there's some, it's a higher base that we're starting to Well, tax. I mean, it, you know, for the liquids, the refills, the jewels, you know, if they're selling two of them for nine ninety nine, mm -hmm. and just to the convenience store, right. it wasn't the same price for anything. Um, you know, it's pretty, pretty close to a pound of cigarettes yeah. in, in, in cost. But you don't tax the matches. But the matches don't probably contribute to your health issue like the paraffin. Well, you this couldn't does. smoke the cigarettes without the matches, and we don't tax the, yeah, but again, the, the, the matches, big lighters. Right, but again, those things don't contribute to the health consequences, okay. which That's these the things do. Yeah, which okay. the, these, these coils do. Okay. That's the difference. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> I think we probably we're won't take this. It's an H bill. Okay. So. I know. I know. How much revenue does it bring? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, the fiscal note says in, in the first year, in the first year, um, $850,000. And. Um, 
in subsequent years it goes up to it goes up to about a million Why does it go up? Year. It goes up because you know some people are price sensitive and that's really who we're aiming at. Uh, I see. Right? But not everybody's that I price, that. As, said as price right. sensitive. Mm -hmm. You know, so so you know, we're hoping I am sorry, I asked why what, you know, it starts at eight hundred right. thousand and then it goes up. But so people will respond to the initial price. Yeah, and say no, and then yeah, and, and, and again, you know, various population, some populations have different have, have different uh, price sensitivity. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but they, we're aiming at really at the youth, who is the most price sensitive. Mm -hmm. But some other folks, I mean, these, 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 these companies are very effective marketers. Does this touch on the internet? I've so heard a little bit about that. Okay, so that's that's another bill. That's H twenty six, which is in. House Human Services right now, and they're going to take testimony upon that. I, I present that to them. And you know, to me, we, we got a three-legged stool here. Okay, the three things that will work together are to increase the, the cost, to raise the smoking and vaping age to 21, and to get rid of the e-cigarette sales because that completely circumvents what we're doing in this bill. Is uh, you know, it, and you can go online. Can we do that? Yeah. Um, get rid of the the, the um, uh, internet sales. Yeah, we don't allow for cigarettes. I mean, right? Uh, for tobacco right. products, it has to go to a licensed distributor. Has to go to a licensed distributor. But but you know when I I went online to say and and their age check in the sites I went to was just a check box. I had to just say yes, I'm 18. I mean, a 10 year old kid. Could go on, if they have a if they have a gift card or something, they could go on and order this stuff. Yeah, you know, and so and you know, you know, unlike teenage smokers, so teenage smokers, ninety percent of them get get the um, tobacco products from their, their buddies who are a little older, between eighteen and twenty one. Mm -hmm. It's only about fifty percent with this stuff because so many kids go online and buy it. So why didn't why didn't you combine those things in this bill? And where, what's the status of because the Because I didn't want to go to multiple committees in, our, in, in the House. This was, this was sort of urgent, and especially once the governor was on board with it, um, you know, um, yeah, uh, I don't mean to be rude, but, right. but, you know, we've gotten so close with the Tobacco 21, but, but not succeeded. I, I didn't want to get nothing. Just out of curiosity, you know, has industry been uh, advocating uh, specifically against uh, this proposal. I, I've got a lot of identical letters, word for word. Uh, disappointed to learn Vermont legislators consider increasing Vermont's cigarette excise tax by $1.25 a pack from 308 to 433 and imposing a brand new 92% tax on vapor products. Do you know whether or not there is, in fact, an industry-led opposition? I don't know for a fact, but I would um, be highly suspicious. You get three or four of the exact same letters. Yeah, you, you know, get that's suspicious. That's well, and the grocers might be right now. <laughs> well, the grocers might be in opposition to this too. Uh, I don't know. The one grocer know. we have in the house was very supportive. Okay. He was on the committee to pass it out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm mostly hearing from my vape shops. Yeah, I am too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Roberto, you're next in line. And after this, we're going to go to cannabis. This is our smoking. Good afternoon. For the record, Roberto Gonzalez from the Office of Legislative Council. Uh, I'm going to be doing a brief walkthrough today of H37. Representative Tills. I think this is your first time yes. here, so you know us. Uh, a few of you, yes. A few? Okay, maybe we'll go around starting with Senator Campion. And Senator Campion uh, from Bennington County. Good to meet you. Senator Ballant from Wyndham County. Senator Pearson from Chittenden County. And Senator from Washington County. Clark McDonald from Orange County. Michael Soronka from Chittenden County. Randy Groff from Franklin County and part of Grand Isle County. Nice to meet you, Mark. And where do you live? In Colchester. So that's the middle of us. That's right, Mazda's district, yeah. Okay. Wrong. But we'll still be nice. So you have nothing, you have no friends here. <laughs> no, that's no, not. No, that's that was not. harsh. I've <laughs> got nothing but friends here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, walk us through. 
Uh, as Representative Till already spoke uh, quite a bit on, uh, this bill proposes to impose on e-cigarettes and the liquid that is used within e-cigarettes, be they liquids with nicotine or not, to the 92% wholesale tax that is currently imposed on uh, other tobacco products. Uh, the bill has uh, just two sections. Uh, section 1 is the main one of the bill. Uh, Section 1.6 proposes to amend Section 7702 of Title 32, uh, specifically in Subdivision 15, uh, by including the following language. Uh, I don't know, we have copies of the bill. Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. So I'll just read the, the underlying part, which is what the bill is proposing to include. Uh, it reads as this. Uh, it includes uh, other tobacco products. would include products sold as a tobacco substitute, as defined in Title 7, of the VSA section 1001 subdivision 8 and including any liquids whether nicotine based or not or delivery devices sold separately for use with a tobacco substitute. Uh, what this uh, proposal effectively does as I previously mentioned is uh, impose upon, upon e-cigarettes and the liquid that is used within them to the tax that is imposed uh, on other tobacco products <coughs> which is a wholesale tax of 92%. Uh, this tax is found in section 7,811 of Title 32. Uh, other than that, uh, the second section of the bill is just the effective date, which is currently set at July 1st of 2019. Okay. Are there any questions concerning that? The amount of the tax, is it equivalent to what we put on also tobacco, I mean on cigarettes? Uh, I mean, this is linking it. It's a bit uh, different in terms of comparison. This is a, a wholesale tax of 92%. I believe cigarettes are uh, subject to a, a stamp tax, mm -hmm. and it, 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 it amounts to a certain dollar amount per, per pack of cigarettes, which is around $3, I believe. Yeah. Do you still need uh, like chewing gum and things like that? Do you need a prescription for that? And if not, would that be included? I believe you, you need a prescription, such uh, as for other for like uh, a <coughs> cessation <coughs> gums. No, you don't need. No, so would that be included in this? Because <coughs> it's uh, sort of a tobacco substitution. Imposing the, the prescription yeah. part? No, it is not included. But no, the tax would be put in a two percent tax, tax on any gum because you don't need a script anymore or a patch. I just want to raise that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. For sure. Yeah. 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 I understand that currently e cigarettes are, are not approved by the FDA as a, a smoking cessation device. So I, I understand that <coughs> prescriptions aren't given out for them. But it's something I can look into. Yeah, I'm just thinking Nicorette gum. I don't think you need a prescription anymore. But it is a. It's, it's over the counter. Yeah, it's over the counter. Yeah. From the Thank definition you. <coughs> of a tobacco substitute says, refers to electronic cigarettes or other devices that have not been approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for tobacco cessation or other medical purposes. Oh, so that uh, might so be a specific okay. limitation yeah. in, okay. in the underlying statute. All right, that just, that would take up the So I'm just curious why it also includes any liquids, whether nicotine-based or not, and what the thinking was there. Um, if what we're trying to do is direct the tax at tobacco products? Uh, I believe that's something that Representative Till could address uh, okay. more fully, but I understand his, his concern was that uh, a liquid that does, doesn't contain nicotine by, may be used by a minor and it might eventually lead mm -hmm. to the use of uh, And again, the underlying nicotine. definition of a tobacco substitute yeah. to refers to something that's designed to deliver nicotine or other substances into the body through the inhaling of vapor and that have not been approved. So what would that be, for example? Well, I gather, we've heard testimony that there have been uh, uh, vaping type devices that deliver fragrances or, or, or oh, other I things, see. but yeah. that do not deliver <clears throat> nicotine. And those are like the, covered as well. They do, so they just sell like a blueberry flavor yeah. thing that you're that you know, Yeah, but you would, I, I think <laughs> what Representative Till did tell us is that the heating coil right can put the formaldehyde, formaldehyde sure. or yeah. other yeah. things, Metal. metals mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. it, which are also not good. And once you start, I mean, that was the argument that this was good for cessation because you get that 
mm -hmm. habit, your mouth, right. and having something there. And so to vape and use a non-nicotine or to cut yourself down, I remember we had some very emotional uh, testimony last year from people who had cut themselves from three packs a day to, mm -hmm. you know, minimal levels or no levels of nicotine, but still use that kind of mouth hunger thing to, mm -hmm. to get by, so. Um, what, uh, it's, we've talked a lot about 92% tax, but is that on the wholesale price or the retail, projected retail, or how does that work? It's on the wholesale price. Okay. So when Representative Till testified that he saw a two-pack uh, for nine bucks or something, he said, we won't, we wouldn't really know, it's not going to add 92% to that price, correct? It's, it's yes. whatever that store paid. Paid, except that is correct. Okay. Yeah, it'll up the whole, it'll definitely up that price. It'll up right, but, but it won't but, be but, 92%. I'm trying to figure out, are we almost price. doubling? Right. I think yeah, it right. might be good, and I know that you, Peter, because this is who gets what, to um, walk us through how we do tax cigarettes. Right. Okay. Because for a while, we played with it every year, no matter what we did. Little cigars seemed to find a way to wiggle out. Um, really? And every year, we had to make tweaks to little cigars. But I know there's floor taxes, and there's stamps, and it's a fairly complicated system. So. You know, what the case is up again, I think that's where we'll start, is how we tax tobacco. tobacco. This sounds more like alcohol, where we just do an excise tax at the wholesale <coughs> level. So, thank you. Any other No. Okay, we're at cannabis. Um, it is moving. We've been asked to be ready to get this out by next Friday, if possible. Um, we will, if Judiciary gets it out and it's getting its recommendations from GovOps, and they will be included. They voted out Friday, we're not going to get it before Wednesday, unless somebody does a token session on Monday. So. Um, we need to be ready to do this. Uh, I have scheduled Graham to come in and just walk us through other states' taxes, but have already been told that we are much smaller. The third tier grower in Massachusetts was the largest tier we envisioned the last time we did a bill, so um, we're, we're really, a world unto ourselves, which is normal. Um, or abnormal. Or abnormal. Yeah, well, we're abnormal, but hey, I come from my peculiar, you know. Um, so anyway, we're going to go through. I've been trying to just get our, just kind of a sense as to how much money is involved, um, how much which gives us an idea of how much we can charge in fees, um, because they have to be relevant to the amount of money you're making, and just working that. So let's start with financial regulation, and I've asked that this one, Aaron, 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 right, here. right there, um, because we heard a lot of concerns about banking and limitations, federal limitations on banks' ability to handle this money. Who's got ice cream or something upstairs? Upstairs. Bag. Uh oh. He's got uh -oh. Uh, apple pie, maple syrup ice cream, or, or maple ice cream, or sweet cream. Oh, yes. One at a time. One at a time. 
All right, I hate it when they do that. Um, but just an idea of what kind of restrictions are we looking at? The thing came up is, is this, we, we had these issues when we started medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. And the concern was big bags of money being carried around in store. And have we made any progress, or is, that, is, is there anyone that can actually handle financial transactions for these kinds of businesses? Uh, sure, sure. So my name is Aaron Ferris. I think that the short answer to that question is that there, there are institutions that are capable of, of you know, lawfully you know, abiding by FinCEN and Financial Crimes Enforcement Network guidance. Um, the ultimate question is, will they be willing to take on the risks and the errors um, with doing so? And, and that's the question I really can't answer for you. I, you know, I, I suspect that if there is a large enough market, I think the medical marijuana market currently is just too small to really make it worth their while to take some of those risks on. I think the possibility is that if there is a, um, a larger tax and regulate market, you know, I think I was on the, the governor's tax and regulate subcommittee, I think, you know, based on the 27% tax rate, we estimated the market was nine to $100 million. You add in the economic multiplier effect of, you know, grower to wholesaler to retailer, and, and, and you're really starting to talk about a large, large volume of, of funds that are possible. Okay. So with medical marijuana right now, mm -hmm. hey, you said there's institutions that could, meaning they have the capability or that they have legal authority. What I meant by that is that they have the, the compliance structures and, and controls in place that, that I, as the banking regulator would feel comfortable with them right. entering that. Ultimately, their board of directors is going to make the, the decision as to sort of the direction but they go. Is this still, because I remember when we did medical marijuana, and then I haven't, I haven't been on mm -hmm. judiciary since then, um, that banks, because of the federal regulation were not allowed to do this and risk federal crackdown? Yeah, so it's sort of, it is sort of murky. Um, you know, by definition, the funds derived from this activity are um, selling a controlled substance, therefore illegal, therefore it's money laundering. Uh, FinCEN did issue guidance in the 2014 time frame based on the coal memos I'm sure you're all aware of, um, which explained the, the the direction and sort of the steps that, that institutions should take in order to um, meet their their federal um, suspicious activity guidelines and sort of responsibilities. However, that didn't take away any of the legal risks that they face. So depending on DOJ policy, yeah, all, all bets are out the window. Okay. What are there other states that are using financial institutions in the way that, that we're talking about here? That's question one. And then question two, what kinds of institutions are we talking about? Are there what categories, classes of institutions that would have the ability to do this? Sure. So so we do have data from FinCEN and roughly um, 300 plus banks are filing reports on a regular basis on marijuana-related businesses. We don't have any detail as to what kind of businesses those are. Okay. And roughly you know, 125 credit unions are filing the same sort of um, reports. With, so, with the feds or with us? Uh, that, that report goes to the federal government through the IRS. Okay. And Do we know which, who any of these institutions are, or is it just simply an aggregate of um, numbers only? No, it's very, very sensitive and, and confidential, so we don't know the specifics, but we do know the, the aggregate data. But this is going to Washington, so the chances are you might have some large national type institutions that would be. I would gather that most of the comp most of the banks and credit unions involved are state charter in state their respective charter. states. Okay. Um, okay. Just given the, the oh, conversations I've had with bankers. You're charter if you're not charter. Right, right, right. Um, okay. I, I have um, had some conversations with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston about their feeling about their services being used to um, in this manner. So whether that's um, Fed wire, so moving money from institution, buying equipment, things like that. The only thing they'll tell us is that they don't want their services used for illegal activity. 
Um, they have access to all of those suspicious activity reports just like we do, mm -hmm. um, so they should know who is doing it. But the FBI isn't showing up. Every, I mean, I don't just for real estate. If we make a large deposit, the FBI does check in. Yes, yeah, so large cash transactions will get you on um, a special report, and then uh, other suspicious activity will get you on another one. Yes. So, um, so we haven't. But to date, and to date, there's a lot more activity going on now than there used to be. When we did medical marijuana, we were one of the first. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we're kind of slackers here. We're coming from behind in the recreational cannabis. Mm -hmm. But to date, there has been no federal Crackdown, so it will depend on the individual banks and boards of directors. Correct. Right. I believe the House Financial Services Committee is meeting tomorrow on the issue. Okay. Um, there's been some movement in the U.S. Senate about sort of um, setting up standards so that if banks follow X, Y, and Z, they will not be prosecuted under money laundering statutes. Okay. Okay. But to, right now, there's we have one There's credit big, union serving the market. Correct? We do. Okay. All right. Where, where so is that? I don't know. The, do they want? The, it was. The, was I won't. I won't say their name. But uh, our former commissioner publicly testified about them. How's that? Okay. So we do have one place that will, which that's correct, should keep you from the big bags of money being toted around and the, that Friday will nights and Saturday some. nights. Okay. I'm not. I'm not certain that one institution could handle the volumes of a full. Sure correct. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Anything else? It's gray and it's murky. The. the uh, I seem to recall there was a concern that from tax that they would have to this along these lines have to accept payments in cash, mm -hmm. and we're not right, actually right. set up to do to that. Do that. Yeah. Um, so while we don't tax marijuana directly at the dispensaries, those guys must pay payroll and other taxes. <coughs> are those coming in in cash, or are we are they setting up checking accounts for that? Do you know? You know, I, I don't know that specifically. I, I would suspect that ultimately um, getting access to banking services really just makes life a lot easier for all of those reasons right there. And we'll have We'll have tax come tell us. I mean, we have medical marijuana as an experience and see how they're how they're working that through. I, I just was meeting with my counterparts in New Hampshire yesterday. Their medical marijuana dispensaries are not served by any local banks. They're served by a bank out of Massachusetts. So I, I don't know if that's an avenue that would help here or not. Is there any reason to believe that this one credit union would treat uh, uh, recreational marijuana different than medical marijuana? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I think ultimately it is the same same um, issues. I don't think they're doing it for um, any other reason than they see members in need and they want to provide services to their members. Uh, Shane Lynn, Executive Director of Champlain Valley Dispensary, Southern Vermont Wellness in Bradboro. Champlain Valley Dispensary is in Burlington, and um, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. I didn't prepare any formal remarks. Uh, just kind of came here to answer questions. And Kent State, I think it's you know public information at this point that we do bank with Vermont State Credit Union, Vermont State Employee Credit Union. Uh, they do offer services to us. Uh, lending is a different matter, though. 
that's an area that they're not comfortable with. Um, and then payroll is another area that they're not, you know, payroll companies aren't uh, interested in doing payroll with us at the bank. That's another area that's a little complicated, but we do so have a checking payroll on your own. We do a payroll on our own. So, um, you know, but we do have a checking account. They do take deposits. Um, okay. You know, we do not, uh, we don't have any credit cards, like anything that's, that's related to using your credit card uh, for my company at this point is a personal credit card. Uh, no company cards. Um, and then at the time of transaction to, to purchase medical cannabis, it's either cash or debit cards. Uh, again, no credit cards uh, are allowed. So they're definitely, the larger players are definitely not touching uh, cannabis related transactions. Um, you know, in the sense of MasterCard, Visa, uh, or any of the larger banks out there that would potentially process credit cards. So it's cash or debit. Or debit. I can't write a check. Uh, we do. If you're, uh, if you're, you know, second, third visit. Yeah, reg yep, well, regular. Yeah. Yeah. In theory, I, I should be a regular. Yep. If you're a dispensary. Um, uh, ATMs, we will, we do have ATMs, but the ATM companies will not allow them to be on dispensary property. So they cannot be uh, expressly rented or bought for cannabis businesses. So you've got to get a friendly neighbor yep. to, okay. Or the landlord and a common space in the building that you might be in. So have, have you taken a look at S4 before? Do you have some res any, any thoughts? I mean, how long have you been in business now? Uh, we're coming up on six years this okay, year. So significant yep. period of time. Yep. Um, yeah, I, yes, I have looked at it. And we have, uh, you know, we're supportive of, uh, of a tax regulate program mm -hmm. at this point. I think, you know, there's been recent news in Burlington of, of a shop selling right on Church Street. Uh, we've seen our business probably decrease between 20 to 30% since last July. And so the medical program oh, has people can go out they can grow their own. They can grow their own, and in fact, to too. just the uh, illegal market is. I'd but say you that. always could grow your own for medical reasons. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you still have to. You still have, you have to sign up. There'd yeah. be so many issues. You know, just there's a lot of hurdles. Doctor, there's fees associated yeah. with it, and so now you can just grow your own. Your neighbor probably grew as well. Uh, and so we've seen, uh, I think it was 5,600 patients on the registry as a high. It's down to 5,300 right now, so it's, it's going backwards. Okay. If S54 were to go through and, and be sent, would you expand your market? Would you, or would you stay as a medical dispenser? Uh, we would most likely try to be involved in the tax regulator right, market, right. just in the sense of... Uh, Otherwise you'll see the continuation of what you're seeing. Yes, yeah. for sure. Okay. Uh, and then back to some of the economies of scales that we try to uh, utilize for lower cost for the medical patients. We're very, you know, heavily regulated by the PPS, uh, and those regulations obviously cost money, and, uh, and so we'd like to potentially see some of those things relaxed, considering uh, there's a tax regulate market. How do those two things? I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, we're regulated by the DPS. Oh, okay, DPS, okay, thank you. Right, now we set up, which made us Yep, um, and the, the Cole memo was mentioned earlier. The Cole memo was, was rescinded under Jeff Sessions, uh, and that was uh, kind of a little nerve-wracking for the industry to see the Cole memo go away because of the assurances it did give banks. Uh, so there might have been some withdrawal from some of the institutions because of, it, because of that. Uh, we're hearing kind of, you know, in some articles that if uh, Barr is appointed AG, he may bring back the Cole memo. Uh, but there are a bunch of, you know, rules and regulations kind of uh, stipulated in the Cole memo that need to be followed for, for campus institutions or businesses like mine to, to kind of fall in uh, compliance with FinCEN. Part of what we're looking at is fees, taxes, um, and just this, uh, I, I guess, part of the concern is, and we don't know, you know, uh, setting a fee to cover the cost of all the regulating everything that needs to be done, which is yet to be named. Um, we can figure out some of them. And I guess, I'm getting a better sense, starting with knowing nothing, about the amount of money that is 
involved and are we going to generate enough to be able to basically tax ourselves to regulate it. I mean, you would be paying to regulate. And I understand you have a $25,000 fee Correct. Yeah. for a, light, a dispensary license. Every year. Every year. Every year. We renew each year. So, uh, you know, uh, if we, we pass our renewal, uh, there's a $25,000 check that goes with it. Uh, and then there are the fees from the uh, patients that are paying fifty dollars right now for, uh, a year for an ID. Um, okay. So those fees do add up, and uh, I think um, you know the fee structure is very important, obviously, in the tax regulate market for mm -hmm. for numerous reasons. One would be to try to minimize the illegal market. So how do you set that fee at a level that's, that's inclusive? That's our question: yep. is the fee and the tax? But it's really hard to get someone to come in and testify about the pricing in the illegal market. Um, so we're kind of going by hearsay. Yeah. Um, you know, it's what somebody you know who knows somebody will tell you they pay on the street or from their neighbor, um, which now they can't do legally, but who knows? $20 in cash changes hands, $50 changes hands. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, um, on the illegal market, I think ounces can sell upwards to four hundred dollars, three hundred dollars. Really, it really depends on quantity uh, or quality and quantity. You know, the, both okay. of those things go together. And, That's right. You know, it is uh, uh, the larger the quantity, uh, the lower the price. So I've heard that some other markets are running <coughs> on quantity. Acreage. Acreage. Okay. Other questions. Do you have a, an opinion of whether these two markets should be merged at all? Uh, in, I think it's S54, did we do kind of leave the DPS and go under the Cannabis <coughs> Control Board, you know, in the hopes that that was to simplify it so that we didn't have two agencies out there mm -hmm. uh, and that the rules and the definitions were all similar because it would start to get confusing if there are different definitions of what even cannabis is. <laughs> so, um, so our hope is that where it does end, that it's it, it's all kind of under one chapter, and then can have sub chapters under it to address um, us and then the tax regulate market. And that was in the future, though. It's not happening. It was once we get yes the recreational market up, then the goal is to get everything in under one authority. And at that point. There might be no illegal market if the feds make changes. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is helpful. Okay. Gwen is here. I don't know. Some of the questions we came up with, <coughs> and GovOx will be dealing with most of it. I was told today that they've gone up to a 2% sales, local options tax that in judiciary um, for local options. I think the question, but, but they said, oh yeah, you could have local zoning, you just couldn't use local zoning to rule it out and get away from doing a public vote as to whether or not you would allow establishments in your town and just trying to get some feedback what's the leads thinking and i'm pretty sure i would not like a cannabis store across the street from my middle school but and i want to make sure that you have that power Thank you. Um, um, I was prepared to talk about um, a question that was proposed, uh, I believe, from your committee about whether or not a municipality could cap the number of establishments. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about okay, it. All well. of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. 
So I, right now, I, I guess I'll start off with the fact that Vermont's a dilingual state, meaning that municipalities don't have any control over anything until we're delegated that authority or authority that is necessarily have applied from that direct authority. Yeah. Okay. So um, we can't cap some municipal or we can't cap uh, cannabis establishments um, because we don't have that authority. Um, we don't have that authority for any Can you cap establishment yeah. um, at all. We can't cap, like even liquor licenses, we can't cap the um, amount of liquor establishments there are unless the board, the liquor control board were to say that we could. You have to have an actual statutory authority. Something is actually cited there. So they could say, we want it and never get it, right? I mean, I live in Brookfield and you might say, woohoo, we want to have an establishment. There's no place in Brookfield where you're going to get an establishment. Maybe you grow, but even then you're not having a point of retail. The one restaurant in town closed, so. But if you get a, even a, just a grow, like you're now that is a business that is like got payroll and you can have more economic activity. I mean, there are ways that even if you're not in a retail setting, the local community might benefit. Um, it, it, it depends on how big the scale is and whether or not there's local employees, whether or not they're adding to the grand list because of whatever things are. Yes, but, right. right. I mean, I guess in, in Burlington, yes. Yeah. But, well, I don't think there's a growth facility that is run by one person. That's that. So, no, I, so I, I, I think there's going to be employees and stuff. Right. Burlington, but Brookfield would like to opt out and have to pay for tips. Okay, I, we're not going I, there. I'm, we just went to No, we're not going there. Off the table. That's about the topic. But that is that that TIF money does go part of it goes into the I think what we may want to find out is because the pilot money, the pilot fund goes to every town that has any kind of a state facility, right down to a salt shed. So interest, does the league know who doesn't have? Um, not, yeah, we, I know we know. But okay, I, I can you can know. you find that information for us? Maybe the, the Department list. of Taxes has sent us that information, so I can reach out. Yeah, we can get. We'll find that out. Just how big? How who's in or how big a group is in and how's that? Right. And I and I, I think the revenue sharing part of the whole local option yeah. thing, I, it's, it's it's more of like we want to make sure that municipalities are taking care of municipalities, and we're not so so we're not so dependent on the state to say like please can you give me money or expecting revenue down the road. It's sort of we want to start we want to start the dialogue of saying you know what enough's enough. We want to take care of our own, and if we can generate even <coughs> not be selfish about it and have a bur Burlington, your mayor is on our board, and he said this makes sense. You know, like let's all be let's pay out to those communities even if they don't want it. If South Burlington votes to not have it, they're still going to have bleed over. Give it well, to they're going to have people that are using and that are driving through. Right. <laughs> I think they they felt like, you know, they've lost yeah. the battle with, you know, liquor and, you know, they want to change the dialogue moving okay. forward and not be so heavily dependent on the property tax all the time. So when you see an, an opportunity, uh, okay. Why not? go for it. Why not? If you don't ask, That's you're not going to get it in the state. <laughs> okay. All right. Other questions? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Okay.